for me, the start was when I could walk. I became interested in insects from that moment on, and it was clear that I was going to spend my life working on insects. So I did the thing that one does. I finished high school and I went to college, and uh, eventually I went to graduate school. And then I started seriously thinking about research projects, and I soon came to realize that uh, I would need some funds for travel, for study, in particular for a trip I wanted to take to the United States to get to see the insect panorama, just get a first hand experience with nature in different forms, insects of different kinds, and how the country was divided up in territories for my favorite creatures. So to travel, I needed some money. So I remember distinctly attending an evening meeting at the Cambridge Entomological Society. This was an organization for insect lovers at Harvard University. And my friend Ed Wilson, now the famous professor at Harvard, gave a talk on ants. And in the audience was an aficionado of ants, an astronomer called Harlow Shapley, who was somehow connected with Sigma Psi. But he might in fact have been the president of Sigma Psi at the time. And he came up to us and asked whether we were going to travel. And we said, yes. He said, well, do you have funds? He said, no. He said, why don't you apply for grant and aid from Sigma Psi, which I think was the first time we heard that such grants were available. And that was the beginning of real scientific existence for me. I connected to the real world. We got a grant for $200. Well, I had a car, so we didn't have to buy a car. It was a 1942 Chevy with 160,000 miles on it, which was a lot of miles in those days. Cars didn't last that long. And we had Coleman lanterns. We had sleeping bags and we each had a cot. We needed food and we needed money for gas. Gas was less than 20 cents a gallon at that time. So with $200, you could get a lot of miles. What we ate was secondary to just keep staying alive. So we lived basically on cans of condensed milk and uh, corned beef, eggs, and spent probably less than a dollar fifty a day for both of us for food. The one thing that we didn't calculate is that the tires of the car were such a disaster that we had in the vicinity. I remember 13 flats in the first 800 miles. So we went to junkyards and begged for old tires, which we got for nothing. And we went through the country at 45 miles per hour, changing tires every, I would say, every 100, 150 miles. And the $200 stretched a long way. We had real adventures. I mean, we once were on the side of the road wondering where we'd spend the night. And uh, a man came by while we were at the side of the road carrying a dead snake and asked us what the snake was. And Wilson gave a whole lecture on snakes, and he said, where are you staying tonight? And I said, we have no place to stay. He said, I've got a motel, which is opening next week. Be my first guest. And we got an unused motel room after having spent a week that started in Death Valley, I believe, where we were just completely exhausted, hadn't had a real shower in I don't know how long, and suddenly had a free motel. 12,000 miles in two months at 45 miles per hour is a lot of driving time. So I was the only driver. Wilson did not have a driver's license. So we had a system. We drove and we learned two insect families per day. He would be reading the book and I'd be driving. Then we would see a location which was definitely worth exploring. We'd park the car, we'd go out. He'd work on ants, I'd work on my insects. And we turned to the car, ate a quick meal, got back in the car, drove till 2 o'clock in the morning, slept a few hours, got up, more adventures. It was the best of learning experiences. But you know, to be a graduate student and to have access to modest grants that might give you a way of realizing your first plans and your first ideas, getting a flavor for those first experiences gives you a memory that stays with you for life. You build on this. 
And I think, although the grants are small, having a budget that you can allocate to students who are at the beginning of their career for them to realize what they're dreaming about is just a wonderful thing. I see Wilson periodically, we've remained the best of friends. And there's been many a time where we just thought back on specific events on that trip, of which there were many memorable ones. In a sandstorm, we lost the hood, which blew away. We ended up tying it to the car. We had a rare break into the window of the car while we were in the car. Ended up taking the last half of the trip without a front window, which means that every time we left the car, we were worried whether the equipment was going to be there when we came back. It was fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. We went to San Francisco Mountain. Wilson climbed to the top. I thought I'd never see him again. He got caught in a thunderstorm in the middle of the lightning. Um, we filled the gas tank with gasoline at 13 cents a gallon in Arizona. We'd never seen gas so cheap. And for me, it was the trip that made the difference in understanding nature and seeing the cohesiveness of life, the interdependence of organisms. And in many ways, I can say I owe it to that $200 grant to Sigma Psi. Science is part of the process of discovery that leads to understanding of what life is all about. But, you know, it's the very occasional scientist who sort of puts the last scoop of whipped cream on, on the ice cream and gives it that extra flavor. Most scientists make little discoveries that don't make it to the news, that don't reap awards. It's getting the idea across that they're as important as a Nobel laureate because they're, in fact, part of the overall establishment that generates the collective information that eventually culminates in some major event. You know, it's wonderful to read Darwin now and all the questions that he asked for which we have answers and that he just saw as, as vaguely illuminated areas of the frontier. Yet it's a continuity of science which is marvelous because you're build it, building upon previous discoveries. You're not providing answers, you're raising new questions. In fact, if a paper that you submit for publication is the definitive answer to something, then it, without raising other possibilities, then it is probably not the ideal paper. Uh, you know, having these strokes of genius that Einstein had with, uh, with his theoretical considerations, that happens rarely. But him figuring out a basic, a basic aspect of the universe did not close the inquiry, quite on the contrary. More questions came up as a consequence of him providing the answers. And that's true for science in general. And that may be a feature of science that is not shared by all human activities.